Hello, everybody. We are back. I decided I would come back on the stage and um, assist these beautiful, beautiful women. And we are really going to take time for this next panel about how to speak for yourself, how to become the CEO of your health. And I think that's so important because what we've learned throughout this entire weekend into today is that there are so many instances in which each and every one of us will have things that happen to us, whether it's with our physical health, with our emotional health, and how do we take that back? How do we capture that back? That's what we're gonna learn today. So here with my esteemed panel, we have Marie Assad, who is an advocate for women's health. And we also have, can you wave? Give yes. us a quick wave. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Dr. Danielle Dre, who is a board certified OBGYN and a senior medical director for medical affairs at Ibsen. Hello there. <laughs> and last but not least, who you've seen earlier this morning and throughout this weekend is Tamsin Fidal, who is an award-winning journalist, author, and menopause advocate who has shared her life from her closet and her bathroom <laughs> on Instagram. And so we're excited to have her here and everyone to share. Thank you. So I wanted to set the stage in how becoming the best advocate for you. I think that when we have women who, through society, through family, through religion through ethnicity and culture sometimes we have been told that we cannot speak up for ourselves or we're not able to tell other people what we're going through and how to share that I wanted to ask each and every one of you what would you say that you when you speak to others about being the best advocate for themselves what are the most important tips or tools that you tell them and how to actually accomplish that we're gonna start with you. We're starting with me, okay. <laughs> All right, perfect, great, great question. So what are the tools? Uh, the tools are, uh, one of the first things I, sell, I say to women is your individual story is your superpower. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening with you, um, what uh, symptoms or issues that you're having are individual to you and they're just as important as anyone else in the room. And so it's important that you share your experience um, if you're having some challenges, um, you want to share those and you want to make sure you bring those for, for, first and foremost um, to your primary care physician or whoever you're working with. And what about you, Danielle? Thank you so much. I think the first tool that we all need to have is self-trust, right? We need mm -hmm. to know that we know our body is best. Yes. We know that we need to advocate for ourselves. I think the second thing is our network, right? We all have a network of some sort, family, friends. And so we need to know to activate that network when necessary. And then I would also just say making sure our voice is heard with our healthcare providers. Uh, you know, I, I think about this often because I think this applies to so many different areas of our life. But you know, I would go to what you're saying is talking about your gut. Because we, we know inherently what, what we need and what's wrong and when we're not being listened to and sometimes that inner voice gets shushed and I, I really think you've got to listen hard to it and you've got to have the right the right people around you to pay attention to and if it's I don't even care if it's a friend that you're saying like look I, I feel like this am I, am I right about this and have somebody encouraging you you need that that good core of you know five people around you that you can go to all the time I think especially during these times in life I, I totally agree with you and I think that that inner voice, sometimes we actually have to practice the muscle of listening to it because environmental factors, outside factors, people will be very, very happy to shush that voice, mm -hmm. that inner voice. And so the more that we're able to actually utilize the muscle of, I know what I'm feeling or I know what I'm thinking and that is right for me and actually making a, a plan of action towards that is the best way that you're going to be yeah. listening to that voice and then using your own voice to be your best own advocate. Now, each of you have had personal experiences and when you've had to kind of push against the grain or speak up for yourself, um, tell me a little bit about what that experience was, but how that felt, maybe if there were moments when you were like, I'm not gonna speak up for myself, or then shifting more into the mode of, no, I'm actually gonna speak up for myself. What was that like for you? And what was that actual moment? Yeah, thank you for asking. So back in 2019, January to be specific, I was in Chicago. The weather, of course, was cold. Was it? It was <laughs> Shocking. It was freezing yeah. in Chicago. And um, I started feeling chronic fatigue. I just didn't, my get up and go was gone. I did not have um, the energy to get out of bed. And, you know, January, I, I thought, well, maybe it's just the weather. By February, it got worse. It didn't get better. And I reached out to my primary care physician. I expressed the concern. Um, I went, met with him. He ran labs, and he said, you need to start eating better and lose some weight. 
And while, you know, obviously all of us can stand to do that, I knew that um, I've been overweight for a while and this was different. And so I um, continued to um, share with him these concerns were continuing to happen. The fatigue was getting worse and I needed answers. And so by March, after uh, three months of the labs being abnormal, um, he f I finally said, what are next steps? Um, I demanded next steps because I was concerned that I did not have the energy to do what I would normally do. My daily activities of living were not there. And so um, he finally said, well, it could be your, your bones or it could be your liver. And I said, I kind of need both. <laughs> so um, I, You were I willing need, to give any of those I was, up? No. no, I need both. I need both. I was in my uh, early 40s. And so um, finally, I started looking for, he's, I knew bones sound a little bit odd. And so I um, looked for a specialist in liver in Chicago. And I was able, thankfully, thank God for good insurance. I was able to call on a Friday. And because I had a good PPO, they said, come on in on Monday. I was able to get answers. I got a specialist. And I got a diagnosis by midweek. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone, um, some that aren't in this room, have the opportunity to go to a, a specialist because they have insurance, good insurance, right? Mm -hmm. And so that determines how soon you get in for your appointment, unfortunately, in our country. Mm -hmm. And so in that instance, um, about 2 a.m. midweek, I got a diagnosis. It was primary biliary cholangitis, or PBC, um, through the MyChart app at 2 a.m. <laughs> How exciting was that? It sent it, <laughs> it sent it right on time. It you remember right the month time. and the date and now I the do. time. I do. Very, you, you like accuracy and precision. Absolutely. That's good. Yeah. And so um, I Google because no one can answer those questions at 2 a.m. And I was frightened. I was frightened mm -hmm. because I didn't know what that was. And what I read on Google was frightening as well because it was a, a chronic um, progressive autoimmune liver condition, never heard of it, didn't know anyone with it, and some of the things you read on Google is not necessarily <laughs> the best thing. Um, and for me, I um, was able to get into the specialist by the end of that weekend, I got answers. The good news was um, I got an early diagnosis, um, and that was um, thankful for me. I was There was a treatment available, and I'm currently on that treatment. Um, one of the reasons why you know, I think it's important to share my story is because there could be other women that are having fatigue. As we age, and the PVC is one of those conditions that impacts us um, primarily at mid, uh, middle age to older women, um, fatigue is the most uh, common symptom, right? Mm -hmm. And so that could be anything. I mean, when you're over 40, it could be a lot of different, it could be menopause. It, it could be, be being over 40. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, thank you for sharing your story and I'm so glad that you were able to get an early diagnosis but one specific thing that you shared that I think is critical for everyone to hear is that you said well what are next steps mm -hmm. that could be the super like power question that you ask of anyone not necessarily just a doctor but whether it's a financial advisor or real estate well what are next steps like where are we going with this mm -hmm. and really demand from that person to give you an answer and if it's not the answer that's going to get you to the next step well then that's a clear indicator for mm -hmm. you to then find someone else who's going to get you to that next step danielle can you share a little bit about your instance and um talking about being your, your own advocate in your struggle absolutely you know Elmarie, when you were talking about what are next steps, I'd love to just circle back on that. It was making me think about, you know, in the office, when we walk in, we have to figure out why the patient is here, right? We see it on the chart, but maybe that's not exactly reflective of reality and, and what the patient's goals are and what they're hoping to achieve. And so when we think about the next steps, I think we also want to check in, what are you wanting, right? What's bothering you the most? How do we get there? And with that conversation and shared decision-making, you know, making a plan that fits the patient's needs and gets us to that next place. I think personally, the, the you know, being on the side of a patient, you know, that the network has been very, very helpful in times of, you know, feeling like maybe I can't advocate for myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Many of us have been pregnant, postpartum. Those are very sensitive and vulnerable times in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think my network has been most helpful. Mine was about uh, four, now or five years ago, but I was anchoring the evening news. I anchored it for, for decades. And um, one night I was having tremendous brain fog and I was looking at words that I recognized, but I, they wouldn't come out of my mouth. And I was having a real, I'd have been having a tough time with retention and brain fog as mm -hmm. I, I didn't know it was called then. Um, and I had, during a commercial break, it was right before the second uh, part of the newscast. And my, I started, the lights were hot. My heart started racing. I had a 
hot flash like I'd never, didn't even know I was having. Um, and I landed on the floor of the bathroom in the mm. studio. I went home, I had two men over me like, are you okay? <laughs> like, do you have food poisoning? Or is your heart bothering you? Mm. Um, and I went home, I, I was like, what, what was that? I went to, fast forward, went to the doctor. I did a, a panel of blood work. I got something in my patient portal. And of all the good things about patient <laughs> Who portals. Who loves a patient portal? <laughs> as good as they are. It's yeah. not where you want to get all your information. Right. And, uh, and it was from a, a male doctor that, who I'd had for years that said, in menopause, any questions? And uh, that started me down this journey. And I haven't stopped asking the questions, uh, you know, because I really didn't understand. I felt like menopause, old. I, I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't understand it. I didn't know the symptoms. I didn't know that's what I had been dealing with. And so I thought it, it was, a, you know, five years ago, if you said I was going to be standing here talking about menopause, <laughs> I was like, what? I don't even know the definition. But today I understand that that is the big problem. I didn't know the definition and I didn't know the word perimenopause. And so that's what led me here. And I think when you uh, talk about what your your career was at that time, which is like you ask questions, like yeah. you keep going for it. But yeah. that really is one way in your health when you're being an advocate for your health is to really curate that sense of curiosity mm -hmm. of saying up oh, that maybe I did get a qu answer to that question, but I want some more or sure. what does this lead to? And then Elle Marie, your sense, you were saying up, oh, but what are next steps? Mm -hmm. Bone and liver. Okay. But what about the liver? Okay. Now what do I need to do? And it's really pushing people to also join your advocate wagon and saying, I'm advocating for myself, but I also need some other partners in this journey, and I'm advocating for you to be on the wagon. And there's no problem in doing that because the people who will be for you and, and help you in that journey will gladly join and say, how can I help? How can I be of service to you? And so I want you to not be, I want you to find people who are gonna be in service to you and not be a, a servitude. Because that's two different things, and that's when you sometimes become a victim to, oh, well, no one's going to help yeah. me, or I'm just going to do this all by myself and not ask for people to rally around me. Mm -hmm. Is find people who will advocate with you and then also be in service to you. Now, I wanted to kind of flip the script when we think about chronic illnesses, right? So even though menopause isn't an illness per se, mm -hmm. it is very chronic, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've heard on many other panels is that once you hit that, it really is for the remainder of your life that you'll be in that menopausal phase. So upon learning through your curiosity about menopause and now being a very strong menopause advocate, knowing that it's going to be something that you're going to have to uh, deal with for the rest of your life. What things have you instituted into your life to help you through that journey as you learn more about menopause? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I, I think there's a lot of things, and we, and we heard some of them on these panels. I mean, I, I do hormones, and that's something that I wasn't sure about. I lost my mother when she was 51 years old, so I had been kind of part of that whole medical system for a very long time, starting at 14, watching, you know, watching her go to doctor after doctor and getting advice and taking the advice and not taking it. Um, so that was, it was a hard decision for me because I had a lot of misinformation early on about that. So hormones are definitely part of my treatment and it took me a long time to not feel shameful that I couldn't handle it myself and just deal with it on my own. It, it really did to, to admit that I was doing that. Um, and so that's really why I'm so vocal about it. I've, I've incorporated other things. I mean, strength training is huge right now for me. I was the girl that was on the treadmill forever, like 30 <laughs> minutes. I, you know, I, I worked off the French fries, um, but now I really, understand you know how important strength training is in my life I make it a priority mm -hmm. and I make sleep a priority if I had to name two things that are uh, that are top of my list those are my two things and then having a doctor that I don't feel afraid to talk to you know and and being aware that the doctors can't do everything you know I have to be part of that team like I have to go in there if there's new information I have to be not afraid to ask those questions because for a long time I was always the you know I would, I would react to what they would say I was never proactive in my health mm -hmm. journey and I realized that that has it's such a priority in addition to being CEO and an advocate for yourself you have to be the CEO of your actual health and what you want that mm -hmm. journey to look you're really the only person who can dictate what that actual journey you can get advice you can get tips you could get medications but if we don't all take those those things and, and utilize them in the best way you know then you really aren't the ceo of your health so mm -hmm. i think that being curious um understanding that the pillar of health and and what that means to you and making it a priority is a big part of how that all is going to turn out in the end mm -hmm. danielle i wanted to ask you a question now when you um think about patients in their journey where they need an advocate as a provider 
How do you motivate or empower people to say, I need you to be your own advocate, right? So a lot of people will go to the doctor and there becomes this kind of dynamic where no one wants to say anything or maybe they're a little bit embarrassed or they don't want to bring up things and then it doesn't really get addressed. How do you as a provider allow them to say, you tell me what you need me to do or how can I empower you to do that? Thank you. I think that's a great question. I think the first thing is creating that space for openness, right? For having that back and forth What's bothering you? What do you want to do? How can we make this better for you in your daily life? Especially as we think about these, you know, kind of these invisible symptoms or kind of chronic symptoms that may not be visible to the naked eye. Um, and I think that openness really lends itself to almost kind of making a treatment plan and a pact in which we can move forward together. I think, you know, offering resources from the office is very helpful because we know these resources are, you know, scientifically and medically accurate, which can be so important and challenging to navigate in the world we're in today. And then I think always offering that, you know, frequent follow-up and touch point, right, to make sure that we're on track and where we want to be. It doesn't always have to, you know, mean coming back to the office. It can be a quick, you know, message on Epic or whatever, you know, electronic health records. She means used. the portal. Yeah, <laughs> quick portal. Which, and I know we all have feelings about the portal here or there, but I think frequent check-ins can be very helpful in whatever way that looks. Thank you. Now, Elmarie, now that you have a diagnosis and you're like, okay, now I'm trying to navigate my life with this diagnosis, how have you helped um, decrease maybe those feelings that want to creep in of uh, despair or this is not a great situation? Because I think those things, whether or not it's controlled or not or managed well or not, I think once you have a diagnosis, that can kind of play a a kind of um, trick in your mind. What have you done personally? And then also talk about the group uh, that you've used as your your base who all have the same diagnosis. How has that also helped you? Great, great, re really good question. So um, first and foremost, um, once I got diagnosed, um, because I work in healthcare, thank God, um, I have worked in community engagement. And so the first thing I wanted to <laughs> is do use the community. Exactly. I want to use my community. I right. wanted to utilize the network and resources locally. And so I reached out to the, the liver organization in Chicago at the time, the foundation, and really set up an appointment to meet with them to talk about what their priorities were in 2019 and how can I support them. Right. After the meeting, at the end of the meeting, I asked, um, so can you tell me more about primary biliary cholangitis? And uh, in full transparency, I recently got diagnosed. Now, of course, they thought it was a business meeting. It was an opportunity to get uh, some donations, right? right? Um, but it was also an opportunity for them to provide resources yeah. for me. And I utilized that relationship. We've started to support them with their walk, but also they connected me with someone locally. And so I got diagnosed in March. And by September, I was, for the first time, able to meet with a group that, um, with other individuals in person that also had PBC. And that was life changing. And so most people with PBC, they first remember the day they got diagnosed and then the day they met another person and it really is life-changing because you realize that you don't just have PVC but you're living with PVC mm -hmm. and what that new normal will look like but it does um, it does give you the opportunity to continue to live and you just have to be, be able to um, adjust your lifestyle accordingly I like that you framed it and we have to continue to live so how do you want to continue to live? And that's how you become the CEO of your health and your best health uh, advocate for yourself is, I'm going to continue to live. Once you make that decision and say, I'm going to continue to live, then you say, I'm going to find the community that's going to also support me and how I continue to live. And then having the uh, medical attention and the medical care that's going to give you the best ways to continue how to live. Now, when we think about chronic diseases, um, I think... As a, as a black physician, as a female physician, I've had to deal with a lot of narratives, specifically in, in the maternal mortality um, perspective of disparities in healthcare. That is something that is very alive and well. Um, and I think in each instance, maybe you can share a little bit about what healthcare disparities has done for you and your diagnosis and Danielle, how you see that on the forefront with maternal care and the Tamsin. I know that you speak to every person who has menopause, so I want to hear maybe your experience with how those those uh, journeys are shared based on healthcare disparities. Yeah. 
Absolutely, great question. Um, so because PBC primarily dispropor disproportionately impacts women, about 90% women and 10% men, um, I think that's one of the reasons why it goes undiagnosed, mm -hmm. why it's un why in women go undiagnosed, it goes unnoticed, I'm sorry. Um, but you see there's a common commonality with everything that we've talked about that primarily impacts women. Mm -hmm. yeah is again, put on the back burner. So this is why all of us in this room need to be an advocate for each other because women's health in general needs to be put on the forefront. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I agree. Um, so I, I think the disparity, the twofold, right? I'm a woman and then I'm a black woman, mm -hmm. right? And so I had the opportunity by volunteering with one of the foundations that advocates for patients with PVC to uh, moderate a discussion around patients of color um, with liver transplant. And what we learned, what I learned, um, which was definitely a heartbreaking as a person living with the liver condition, is that um, unfortunately African Americans are more likely to be delisted once mm -hmm. they get added to the liver transplant list. So if you can imagine finally getting on the list and then your um, culture, your um, race, are most likely to be taken off the liver transplant list. I did not know that, and that's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, early in my diagnosis, I'm taking medication and I'm hoping not to be there, um, but to know that individuals that look like me are less likely to get a liver transplant, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I think knowledge is power because you were able to see that statistic and understand it um, only drives you more to being like, how do I sustain my health in a way that maybe I don't necessarily need to be on the liver transplant list, but I think knowledge is power. Knowing more is only going to help you make better decisions and knowing what treatments are best for your management plans or how to go through a diagnosis or just life in general, knowledge is power. So sharing more information, also vetting your information. I think that's important as well. Information comes a, a mile a minute at this day and age and some of it is not Good, some of it is misinformation. So finding your community, but making sure that the information that's shared and received is also vetted. Danielle, what would you say about uh, maternal mortality um, and disparities? Absolutely, I think it's, it's a great question, especially in this country right now, and it's a, it's a huge topic. As we think about these disparities, particularly particularly in the maternal space, um, you know, I, I think we need to think about avoiding these buckets of diagnoses, right? Mm -hmm. Writing something off that, oh, maybe it's just obesity, maybe it's just depression, not sure why this person is coming in. I think we really need to look at each person individually, right? Taking care of the whole person to understand what is going on with their mind, body, what are they bringing in from their history, cultural context, um, to really think about the person, you know, the patient sitting in front of us and what we can do in that moment, right? The worst thing is having blinders on and potentially missing something because we aren't thinking of this one mom, mom to be mm -hmm. in front of us. Um, and I think that can really make the difference especially as we think of some of these conditions which are not normalized, right? I think that's another piece that we do need to normalize some of these symptoms, chronic symptoms, um, and, and think about how we make it part of the daily conversation to minimize and remove some of the stigma associated with it. Okay, so I'm gonna pick your brain here um, because you speak to so many people. I keep saying that, but you really do speak to so many people. And so many people reach out to you about their journey as well. So experience sharing is a big part of what has helped you kind of push this narrative and, and share your voice when it comes to menopause. How have you seen the differences maybe from the people who reach out to you and, and who you speak to about healthcare disparities as far as ethnicity and how menopause and what that story looks like for, for each ethnicity? Well, I think, you know, we know by research that black women come into menopause often earlier and have more intense symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so um, that we know, but there's not enough research that's been done on so many things. And that's the part that's so frustrating. And that, that's where my advocacy lies, because we, we can ask women to share their stories. Some feel comfortable, some don't. We can tell them to, you know, to speak out. But if we don't have that actual research mm -hmm. to be able to help them down the line when they walk into a doctor's office or they're going to ask for help or they're sharing their story, then what's the point? Right. And so so that's really why I feel so strongly about it because there, there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of a, a lack of ability to have access, lack of ability to, to find a doctor that's going to treat them specifically. Not everyone can go to a menopause specialist. Not everybody can access a doctor in person. And so, uh, you know, so that's where I am 
am with regard to seeing those stories. And I have all different stories. And you're right. And we ask people to speak out, but not everybody's comfortable with that. Yeah. So sometimes yep. we have to go to them in order to, to educate and help them. And I think that that's, that's what's most important to me. So when we say to, to be the CEO of your health, that's important. But we also have to empower people yeah. to do that with the right, the right knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I just wanted to add, I, I love that, and I, I agree 100%. I also think um, one of the reasons why I've continued to share my story is because I think if I help one woman yeah. mm -hmm. get, you know, that's yeah. having fatigue or know someone that's having fatigue get diagnosed, yeah. I've made a difference, right? Sorry, made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I have to encourage my sisters, right, mm -hmm. to participate yes. in those clinical trials. Yes. And so I yes. share my story because it's an opportunity so for important. me yep. to, to stand up, to be counted, to mm -hmm. be willing to share my story, be willing to be a participant in those trials, mm -hmm. I think it makes a difference. Obviously, a large number of us are taking medications mm -hmm. that haven't been um, tried on mm -hmm. African Americans because mm -hmm. we're not participating. And so just sharing my story, hopefully it makes an impact and it inspires others to do more. I think that's an important point is that we are put in these positions to help encourage and motivate others to do so as well. But just a note, who knew this show of hands when it comes to women, who knew that it was only until like the 1990s that women were like included in studies as mm -hmm. equally as men. Mm -hmm. so, so did you know that women are not little men? <laughs> <laughs> I think they thought this for a very long time, but we are yeah. not little men. And then it wasn't until the mid 90s when we think of dementia. So think of dementia and you're like, yeah, I've maybe heard of a few people with dementia or it is in the 70th percentile of dementia cases that are women. But it wasn't until the 90s that researchers actually learned that the reason was because of the decline of estrogen, mm -hmm. which had a significant impact on the brain, is that why they were like, oh, well, that's why so many women are getting dementia. So think of just yourself as an individual sitting here and saying, all the things that may come into my line of, of health that may you know, give me a little knock here or there down the road, based on family history, based on you know just how I live my life. But as a woman, so many things that are going to come your way but haven't been researched mm -hmm. doesn't really help us in the end because no. we don't necessarily know how to correlate a treatment or a management plan to a woman. So again, research is so mm -hmm. very important because other than research, and not on little men, but actual <laughs> women, then we actually know what to do with women. Now, everyone here has an amazing and, and different, and I like that we have a panel that has different entities of, of what you actually do. What was it that inspired you in that moment that you're like, I'm going to be the person who is doing this platform? I know, Tamsin, you shared that, you know, as you're on the floor in the cold, I'm sure that wasn't the moment that you're like, I'm going to be a menopause <laughs> advocate. <laughs> But when was it as you were learning more that you were like, I have to do something, I have to share my voice? What, when was that for you? Yeah, I think I was in the middle of the pandemic and I remember- I, I thought you were gonna say I was in the middle of the floor no, again. No, no, no. Like, what is with this floor? Actually, in that moment. No, uh, I, it was in the middle of the pandemic and I remember I was doing research because that's what I know to do. I just, and I remember reading 1 billion women were gonna be in menopause by the year, it was at that point, 2025, yeah. 2030, and I went, a, a billion women in the world are gonna be in menopause? Like, how is that gonna work? Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I couldn't believe that number. And then I couldn't believe what I didn't know. I mean, I spent days, years, decades, covering stories, asking questions, going into to neighborhoods to you know bring stories to life. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Like, how did I not know something like that? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that through time and asking questions and doctors, many of them here today, many of them sitting here being willing to share their information. And we talked about this yesterday. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you simplify information and you make it accessible for women who don't have a PhD or mm -hmm. you know um, behind their name and can understand it and feel comfortable talking talking about it, that makes all the difference in the world. So that helped people help me, like you, help encourage me to speak out. So it was, it was kind of like during the pandemic when we were all stuck in our homes yeah. and not going anywhere. Interviewed doctor after doctor right. after doctor. <laughs> like, that oh. you were like, I'm going to now be the voice and I'm oh. going to share my story. Do you remember the first time that you were I, like, I'm going to share my actual I did. story? I, I shared it on TikTok the first time because <laughs> I, I didn't know a lot of people on TikTok. So I'm like, if I go there and it's not well received, then, I, you know, my bosses aren't there. My friends aren't there. No one will see it. Um, so I did. I went on there and I read 34 symptoms of menopause. And then of this reaction was unbelievable. And I went, oh, maybe there's something. 
maybe there's other people don't have this information as well. Right. And so, you know, that it took me some time to open up because I was, mm -hmm. I was scared of, at that point I was, you know, around my fifties, I was scared of aging out of TV. TV mm -hmm. is, you know, oftentimes for younger right. women through the years. And so I was scared about that. I was, I, I was just scared of becoming irrelevant if I went out and said like, I have, I'm in menopause. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as the more I talked about it and the more that other women encouraged me to talk about it, that's really when it happened. I, I don't know that I ever made the decision. It just, it came, it came, it found me. It menopause found, found me. Yeah. It did. And it finds 100% yeah. of women. <laughs> it's interesting. It just comes knocking on your door. Thank you to the panel for Thank sharing you. each of Thank your you. individual stories.